Sixties Loco Spotting at Manchester, Victoria by Ian Robinson. I first visited Manchester, Victoria station with a friend from school, a lad called Mike, who was a year older than me. We put our two pence in the machine and, cameras and notebooks hidden in our duffel bags, contrived to pass the baleful gaze of the Gestapo on the ticket barriers. It was a gloomy, smoke-blackened place, Victoria, malodorously held together by soot and pigeon droppings. In there, you inhaled the breath of steam engines, that warm, damp aroma of oil, coal smoke and steam that all us Grisers know and love. I felt my pulse quickening every time I walked inside the station. There was also the pervasive, swirling odour sweet yet astringent from the two breweries nearby, an intoxicating, heady mixture that I'll always remember. Victoria had a, a manky, brown-tiled subway and a soot-encrusted lattice footbridge for luggage, a grubby calf on platform 12, and overall an air of forgotten gentility. The Luftwaffe had bombed it, but did a half fast job. Neglect and decay tried to finish the project, but somehow the place hung on. British Railways wanted to, I don't know, rationalise it, turn it into a two-platform, unstaffed halt. Thankfully that didn't happen. The station persisted. It all seemed hopelessly antediluvian and ramshackle, yet all the same it was busy. Trains stopped and started, often in some unseen part of the place. Whistles and chuff sounded from off stage, while coal and parcel trains thundered through the centre lines. Best of all were the bankers, waiting as if it was all the same to them, across from platform 11, poised for the whistle of a freight whose driver had decided his engine couldn't make the miles platting bank. Of course, sometimes the crew of a freight would reject the bankers and take a run at the incline. There was a speed limit through exchange, so that took some doing. There was often good-natured shouting between the crews. Sometimes they got up the bank, sometimes they didn't. And the banker, apparently against its better judgement, would have to shuffle up after the train. This was high drama to us lads on the platform, and we would shout encouragement to the banker. It must have been quite a job, keeping the engines quiet during those spells of inactivity. Sometimes, if it was a passenger train, the banker would be attached at exchange. This was the other end of Platform 11, which mutated into Platform 3 of Manchester Exchange. At one time Europe's longest platform at 2,238 feet. It was as if Victoria kept this interloper exchange at arm's length by one long outstretched platform. A good thing about Victoria was that the loco crews were generally friendly. Sometimes the banker fireman would be sent for drinks or food from the calf and would have a few words for us. My friend Mike even got a cab ride in the banker, the lucky sod. He always did have the gift of the gab. This was in stark contrast to the platform staff who weren't keen on us spotters. We'd sit on a handy platform barrow until one of the porters saw us and he'd shout, telling us to get off the barrow. The drivers of the brute platform trolleys would often aim at us, so that we had to jump out of the way in fear of our lives. We disliked them all. Mike said they were just frustrated because they couldn't work in the loco department. They were too thick. In my time, the bankers were class fives, although I did see a BR class 4 MT once. Mike said he'd seen a couple of X L and Y 060 tender locos sitting on the banker's road, but I wondered about that. Although later I found out it was true. ATFs were common on the coal trains. Then there were parcels trains, usually hauled by Black Fives again, or on one occasion by a scruffy Scot. The bankers and many of the locos around Victoria came from Newton Heath, 26A. Mike and I decided one day to take a trip to 26A. We'd be no good at orienteering, as we had to ask a woman where Newton Heath was. I think I expected a sign to read, Newton Heath Loco Depot, this way lads. 
Things got tricky as she suggested that perhaps we should be in school. Looking doubtful and without speaking, she extended an arm and we went off in the direction of her scrawny guidepost. I kept looking back and she was still there, watching us as we walked away. I think she knew what we were up to all right. Anyway, soon we saw the unmistakable sight of a cooling tower, rising above the houses amid a pall of smoke. Game on. I was discouraged by a sign which said, Engine spotters are not welcome, or something like that. But Mike just strolled in, bold as brass. I scurried after him like a mouse. It was vast, the largest shed I'd seen. Half of it was occupied by diesels, and a cheap-looking corrugated asbestos edifice. In the old shed next door, there were at least twenty steamers, including a couple of Ivor 2MTs simmering away. Mike said they were for use in the colliery sidings. The driver looked at us and nodded his head, friendly-like. Then we saw some other lads and approached them. They were locals, bunking school like we were. Like almost everybody here, they were friendly. We caught the locos, including a 9F, and 45156 Ayrshire Yeomanry, which was a Rose Grove 10F loco. I don't know what it was doing there. But back to Victoria. On the platform, some lads told us of seeing Britannias, Patriots and B1s. I wondered if they were tall stories, but I didn't care. I was having a great time. Sitting there with our duffel bags full of sandwiches, bread rolls were my favourite, covered with craft cheese or polony. Then crisps with a little blue bag of salt. I was always short of cash, though and I envied the lads who bought pies from the calf or penguin biscuits. I returned to Victoria many times, hoping for another fix of that atmosphere, but fearing that it might have succumbed to gravity and fallen to bits since my last visit. But no, it was always there. I got a camera from my uncle one Christmas and took as many photographs as my meagre finances allowed. It seemed to be a cause of annoyance to my parents, as if they begrudged it, which was strange. Later, when I was 18, I moved to art college in Manchester, and my mum promptly destroyed all my photographs in a bonfire, saying that I should have cleared out all my stuff sooner. I don't suppose my photos were any good, but I wish I still had them. Thank you, by the way for the generosity of the photographers who have allowed me to use their work on here. Mike told me about a long train late at night that used to leave from Platform 11 with parcels. I later realised that this was the famous Red Bank newspaper train. I did see an impossibly long parcels consist return empty one afternoon with a black five at the head. Red Bank sidings and carriage sheds has been swept away now by the redevelopment works, along with much of the old Victoria. You can still trace the remains, though, looking like fossils in Google Earth. At the platform end, we spoke our own strange Argo. I remember we all called Class 5's Blackies when I was a kid. Sometimes you'd see a crab, a Hughes Fowler mogul, come through. My uncle, an engine driver, called those blowers. Apart from the duchesses, they were my favourite locos. Stania's mogul was called a camel. I suppose because of the top feed. Although camel seemed to be a locoman's catch-all term for steam locos in the 60s for some reason. The austerity 210s were called iron lungs. When we arrived at the platform end, we would ask... What game on? And one of the lads might reply, Some pretty swift stuff. You just missed a jube. I soon realised that there were many traces of Victoria's Ellen Y heritage. The war memorial and the lovely, almost Art Nouveau mosaic signs above the bookstall. I began to notice the legends on the walls, like petroglyphs that referred to the Lancashire and Yorkshire Railway. Talking of the bookstall, my friend Mike, who looked a good bit older than me, usually bought a girly mag from there on our visits. 
I remember us looking at one excitedly on the train home. The bookstall is now an information centre, and the calf, of course, is a Starbucks. The renovation has been a wonderful thing for the frontage and for the circulation area, but once you get into the station proper, it is a gloomy, claustrophobic, diesel-soaked netherworld. I do like the trams, though. They're the final apotheosis of Pick Vic, the interstation scheme that took a couple of decades to gel properly, against all odds, it seemed. At one point in the 70s, I think, there was a fleet of small Dennis or Sedan buses between the stations. There was also a doomed scheme for an underground link between Piccadilly and Victoria. One of my last memories of the old station is from the late 70s, when I took a train to North Wales with my girlfriend. I was on my best behaviour and in a high old state of anticipation, but still noticed that the train was hauled by a spluttering rail blue 47. To my surprise, somehow much of the dilapidated atmosphere of Victoria still endured, even at that date. But the freight trains, whistling for a banker from the centre road, had gone by then, as had the Black Fives. Exchange had been razed to the ground, Red Bank sidings also. Steam's aroma had departed. The diesels were in charge now with their mephitic fumes. All that remained to remind me of my happy times at Victoria was the occasional whiff of hops from the brewery or the ghostly squeal of flanges on the Cheetham Hill curve. Thanks for watching, and if you enjoyed this, please subscribe. Lastly, thank you to all the photographers who generously helped with this video. It'd be meaningless without you all. And please, keep an eye out for the next episode.